Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Church Leadership Lab, where we get to have conversations that empower healthy churches. We're really excited to bring you another one of those today. Hey, quick reminder, if you find this helpful, if you learn something, if you think another church leader might benefit, we'd love if you could share this. Uh, subscribe, leave a review, do all of those things. Just helps us get these conversations into more church leaders' ears, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, today, I'm excited to have on the show Nathan Gaddis. Uh, Nathan is formerly a Grammy-nominated singer and member of True Vibe who performed alongside of Beyonce, Destiny's Child, and Sync. Uh, and then sensing a call to ministry, he eventually left the music industry and transitioned to serving the church for 18 years uh, as a worship pastor in various churches. Then in 2017, Nathan uh, became the owner and CEO of Design 373, a digital outreach company that partners with churches all over the country to equip them with strategies, systems, and processes to better reach the people in their own communities. Now, Nathan resides in Florida with his wife and best friend, Bethany. Their are four children. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. We appreciate it's, it. Now, you weird. have a really It's weird hearing your life wrapped up in, in a few paragraphs. That's, that's really strange. Yeah, right. It's a it's a quick flyby. Um, you have some you you already have some interesting things in your bio. So what we like to do is we we ask every guest what's something that doesn't make your public bio, but all your friends and family know about you. So you can either answer that or you can answer what it was like to to perform with Beyonce. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go with the first one. Although I will cool. say this, I will say this. Uh, Beyonce is. Uh, at least when we were on tour with them, um, she's a class act. And nice. uh, the first time that, you know, I, I can't, it's hard because it's been, it's been 20 years, you know, since, yeah. since that happened. So um, I can't speak to where she is now, uh, but she was incredible. The whole team, her whole crew was just so welcoming, so loving and generous to us. I think I, the, the biggest thing that I remember is um, the first time that we met them, uh, Destiny's Child, uh, mm -hmm. we walked into their dressing room and Beyonce and Michelle and Kelly were in there and, and they didn't know we were coming and they had, uh, they were like, they had worship music just blaring, like just mm -hmm. gospel music. It was, it was so cool to see that. Uh, and then you know, two hours later, they're rocking on the stage with 20,000 people in the stands. So yeah. it was it was a really cool experience. And, and I have nothing but um, nothing but uh, just love and appreciation for everything that they they did and showed us. Uh, yeah. As far as we, awesome. we I mean, we were a brand new band at the time. So uh, the, our first concert like ever, our first concert that we ever did was on tour with Destiny's Child in front of, at that time it was like 10,000 people. So the four of us in the band were like, this it, w this isn't real life. Like this is yeah. crazy. Talk and about so, going like zero to 60, you know what I mean? Oh Just, my gosh, it was, it was, yeah. in, it was nuts. So yeah. to answer your other question, uh, just real quick. Um, let's see, I, I am a closet inventor. I love to okay. invent things. I've never gotten a patent on anything because everything that I invent comes out five months later and someone's already invented it. So <laughs> that's usually how my luck goes. I, yeah. um, I am, I've always had this, this secret desire to be on Broadway in New York. Mm. Um, I, I'm a sneaker head. I love tennis shoes. Um, and I think the final thing that I could think of would be, I am deathly afraid of the ocean, even though okay. I live in a coastal city. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. I love the beach. I yeah. go to the beach, but you get me in the water and I am, I, I freeze. Like, yeah, that, I was stung that. by a jellyfish when I was, when I was younger. And okay. I think that just kind of, you know, poured into that mindset and psyche of me in the ocean. So there's that. Yeah. 
That'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah. Well, you have you have so many things that I feel like we could go on so many tangents about, but we'll save that for for a part two or something. Let's um, go. I know we want to we want to jump into talking about uh, all things uh, specifically, kind of social media, digital engagement. You yeah. know, all the things that that you all serve the church with. Um, now you live in that world, uh, and especially for churches. So. What are you seeing right now that you feel like, man, is really working well, is really helping with that idea of digital engagement? Mm -hmm. And then what are you seeing as well that's kind of a pitfall to avoid? Hmm. Well, I think I think to to start with the first half of the question, what's working really well, the churches that that we see as a company that's doing it really, really well, um, they understand, you know, um, they understand that social media is actually an extension of their ministry, mm -hmm. that it's not just a extra thing that they have to manage um, or be bothered by, or I, I don't know, um, kind of it gets in the way of other things that are happening in the ministry. The, the, the churches that are really, really seeing success on social platforms uh, are the ones that that understand that it is an extension of ministry and it's not just um, a tool that they can use to get the word out about Anna's tea party that's happening, you know, this Thursday night. Um, yeah. Although those are important, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just saying the churches that really, really do it well, um, they they're seeing the fruit of it when they treat it like a ministry and not just a a social platform that they have to manage, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. It I think, does. Yeah. I, I think the pitfalls, um, gosh, oof, this is a hot take. Okay. Um, all right, let's hear okay. it. Okay. So the pitfalls thinking that, um, I might get in trouble for um, this one might get me in trouble, Scott. So I, right. I'm, I'm hoping, um, we go there. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. Yeah. So pitfalls, thinking that posting candid pictures of your, of your weekend services or videos uh, of your, just videos of the, the pastor and the, the reels and things like that, um, thinking that that is going to really move the needle more than what you think. I think that's one of the, the, big pitfalls. And, and look, I love pictures. In fact, um, the, the clients and the churches that we serve, um, I encourage them, Hey, find a photographer in your church. Hey, hire yeah. a photographer. If you need pictures, especially for major events and things like that. And, but I think there, there's this misconception, I think that uh, a lot of churches step into when they think that, all we have to do is post pictures of, of who we are as a church, um, and and it will grow our reach, our engagement, even our church membership and, and weekend numbers as far as attendance is concerned. Yeah. And I think uh, while it's a it's an aspect of of seeing a healthy social media platforms, it's not the end all because at the end of the day, you can have the best pictures, you can have the best videos, you can have the best graphics. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But if you don't have a culture of engagement, if you haven't done the work to build that culture of engagement into your people, into your staff, then a lot of times what your social platforms can end up looking like is just a yearbook of all the things that are happening at the church throughout the year and yeah. um and, and let's just let's just be honest uh, you know there are people that really really think that uh if guests and visitors see pictures of life happening in the church that they're going to come that they're going to want to be a part of that and right. i think in this i think i think in this post christian culture that we're living in and and experiencing right now that's just not true totally. um they they don't care. Um, right. They they want to know if you're making a difference in the community. They want to know if you're making a difference in their in the state. They want to know if you're making a difference worldwide or in the country. 
They they yeah. don't care to see just pictures of people smiling and laughing in the lobby. Now, those things enhance everything else, but sure. you have to have a culture of engagement for those things to kind of be everything that you would want them to be, if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah, it definitely does. I'd love to kind of dig in a little bit further because what I hear you saying is 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 understanding that your social media is not as much just for, I mean, we talked about, you know, uh, Anna's tea party, but the yearbook, like it's not as much for, it's not that it's not at all, but it's not as much for, right. here's what we are doing. Here's what we have going on. Come to us, come to our thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's really, you know, looking to see how can we get side our outside our walls. And so less right. for those who are already here. Um, mm -hmm. And so how can churches use social media to do that? Like to reach outside their walls and really impact the people in their community? Well, I think there's a couple different ways. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, the first thing I think of is engaging with, with other businesses and restaurants and popular um popular things in your area, wherever your church is located. Um, I think if you were to engage with the community um, as the church, not yeah. as the admin or the person that manages the church page, but as you go in as the church and you start to engage with um, the businesses and organizations in your area, I, I think, you know, you think of a, um, Think of a local coffee shop. You know, if if there is a a local coffee shop in your area, I'm talking to your listeners, obviously, right now. But if there's if there's a coffee shop in your area, and they come out with a new fall drink, you know, hey, you know this this new um, incredible pumpkin whatever toffee, yeah. and uh, a simple thing that the church can do is to jump in on that post and say. Hey, this looks incredible. We we can't wait to try this. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it, it's not necessarily an endorsement of any businesses or organizations just because you're commenting on their social feed. Um, yeah. I, I think you have to obviously you have to be careful with who you engage with. Let that that goes sure. unsaid. Um, but uh, what happens when you do that sort of thing is the thousand people that follow that coffee shop suddenly see a church in their community uh, engaging with them on their social platform and yeah. they think wow this is kind of different and this is kind of cool especially if they see them everywhere and that's that's where we get into like the the brand saturation when we talk marketing you know because I'm yeah. a, I'm a I'm a I'm a church marketer and a lot of church staff don't like that word marketing, but it is what sure. it is. I mean, we're just marketing the best, um, the best thing in the history of the universe. And that yeah. is a relationship with Jesus and all that he has. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot we could, there's a lot we can learn too from. Sure. Uh, uh, there's, there's been a lot of money spent, a lot of time, uh, spent around how do people think and behave and act and interact and um mm -hmm. when it comes to a marketing sense and so yeah i think to use those things um is is certainly wise knowing yeah yeah you're 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 not i think people couple marketing and sales together and they so are then it's like yeah they're like oh so we're we're not selling something here we're right not. it's like i exactly. get it but there's a lot to learn and i think i i, I think to to even take it a step further, there are other things, you know, uh, we call that what I just described to you. We, in, in my company, we call that the community bucket. So we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're just dropping content into that bucket when we go to the restaurants or the coffee shops or the school systems or whatever. And we think teachers in the school systems or, um, anything like that. That's, that's the community bucket. Uh, there is another bucket called the reach and engagement bucket. And that has everything to do to answer your question about how to how to reach outside the church walls. One of the things that we found over the years of doing this, I mean, we've been doing this now for 10 years. And one of the things that we found is one of the main algorithms that exist is conversation. So if conversation isn't happening, 
on your yeah. church feed, which is part of that whole culture of engagement mentality. Uh, yep. If if conversation isn't happening on your church feed, then statistically, uh, most of the people who even follow your church page are never seeing the content that you're putting out because it's yeah. never telling the bots, the algorithms, this must be an important conversation. I'm going to push this and prioritize this to the people that that followed this page because it yeah. seems to be important. It's 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 getting engagement that's not uh, normal for for this church. And so what that looks like in real life is taking content that that people outside the church walls are already engaging in, like they're already doing it by themselves on their on their phones. You know, we know uh, through research and all of the things that have happened in the last. Gosh, uh, well, at least in the last eight years, uh, one of the things that we realize is that people are spending a boatload of time on social media and yeah. their their phones and tablets, two to three hours a day. Eighty more than eighty percent of the community, wherever you're listening, more than eighty percent of your community is is on social platforms two to three hours a day and that's average so that means there's there's some people that are going way above that you know to to level that average out so yeah um there is uh we have we have these really lofty goals to reach our entire community a lot of times with 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 church staff and and the the desire of the lead pastors and things like that um but it 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 really starts with engaging the people that are already in the what i would call the the shadow of the steeple right mm. the people who are who are in the shadow of your physical location um because what i have seen throughout the country is a lot of churches will will want to reach a certain demographic of people, right? And but the the problem is the people that are in their circle of influence in the shadow of their steeple are not in that demographic maybe. Mm. And and so they ignore them. Yeah. And and I think um if you want to see your church explode, uh then start reaching the people that are around your church. Um, because every church has people around the church that don't go yeah. to that church. I, I, I don't know any church uh, unless it's a really small town, rural, uh, area in, in, and there's not very many people population wise in that city, but the majority of the churches that we encounter, that we talk with, that we partner with, there are people in their shadow of their steeple that are, that are lost and they need Jesus and yep. they may not fit in your demographic, but you need to figure out what to do with them if they show up at your church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So no, that's, that's really good. And I think sometimes too, we forget that it, it's called social media and mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, there's a big aspect of it. Like you talked about engaging, um, commenting, conversation, all of that. Like those are all social aspects and there's yeah. still, despite how it's all changed, yeah. right. From, the, the beginnings to now mm -hmm. there's still that element that i think um exists that's really important to 100%. remember you know when you're when you're kind of engaging with it mm -hmm. now I, I do know the nature of that though is is that you can sometimes slip into kind of the comparison game and so mm. yes you're out there kind of creating content um but you kind of see well this is what this church across the country that I really liked doing this, is what this pastor, yeah. you know, across the country is doing. Um, yeah. And to your point, well, you're not in either of those contexts. You're where you are in your community. So um, I'm curious, like how, what advice would you give to churches to avoid this trap and to focus on kind of creating that unique and authentic online presence for who they are and where they're at? Um, that's a great question. I think, First of all, comparing, 
comparing to spark inspiration of of creativity is very different than allowing it to uh, turn into a lazy a lazily is that even a word lazily yeah okay well, lazily we'll, it officially is now yeah say it so um <laughs> when it when it turns into lazily creating content because of the comparison i think that's when that's when you cross that line um and 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 the fact is scott we we know biblically that there's nothing new under the sun everybody every creative that i know um borrows inspiration from other artists right, right. every every business even there there's even in the business world there's really not anything new it's just recycled and reframed right. and remolded into something that looks different that's really the same thing that this other company or this other church is doing and yeah. i think i think where um I think where we lose it in the comparison world, when we when we live there, we lose it when we make the mistake of of not adapting what we see and compare ourselves to. We're not adapting it to the culture of our own community and our mm. own church. Because yeah. what works for a church in California would never work for a church in South Carolina. Right. You know what I mean? And so uh, you can look all day long at the comparison, but if you're not adapting it to and, and that's where the creativity comes in is when you have when you're forced to adapt to your culture and your people, then you are creating something new. I mm -hmm. love. Um, well, let me let me say this. Um, the other thing is, is remember the A to Z rule is, is kind of where, where I land on this is. The A to Z rule is when you're looking at a church that's two states, three states away from where you are, um, when you're comparing and and trying to identify things that you see on their page that you would love to see on your social platforms for the church, I, I think remembering the A to Z, um, that church that is your hero church, whatever, whoever the church is, yeah. um, they are at point Z. And you are at point A. And so you can't, you can't expect a fast pivot and shift to immediately start having the results that the church that's at point Z um, has worked hard to build that culture, right? Right. The, the churches that are really, really getting it right they understand that they've spent years building the culture of, of, of engagement. So it doesn't matter what they post. It yeah. gets shared thousands of times on some of these larger churches and hundreds of times on some medium churches, but like it, they've built that into their culture. So you can't right. compare yourself to church Z when you are church a, and there's a lot of steps in between those two things that have to happen in order for you to get to Z. Now, yeah. it's possible to get to Z, right? But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of intentionality. It takes a lot of creativity even. Yeah. Um, when you're trying to grow that that uh, engagement culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, totally I think does. one of my favorite books that I've ever read um, was a book called Steal Like an Artist. Have you ever heard yeah. that? Oh, have I was going to actually mention that when you talked about kind of the borrowing and all of that. I think that's a fantastic yeah. book. I, I, when I was on staff as the uh, creative pastor, worship pastor at my last church that I served on, I gave my creative team that book. Um, nice. And it's actually, it's actually up here. Um, yeah. I gave my team that book and they were just, <laughs> they, they were mortified when they, when, when they, looked at it upon first glance, because when you read a title as a church staff and you go, um, <laughs> steal like an artist. Yeah. They don't have any idea what it's going to say inside. And so they were, they were kind of frustrated and, and upset that I was basically, they took it as me giving them permission to steal other people's work. 
which yeah. is not the case if you've read right. the book. And so I don't want to give it away for, for the people listening, but, but go get the book. In fact, um, one of those, one of those creative team members, uh, who actually still works for design three, seven, three, I, I kind of brought him on as uh, we brought him on, uh, years yeah. ago as a social media graphic designer. Cause he's really, really good. And he texted me, it was, it was a couple months ago now. Like, so we're, we're thinking, we're talking th- Three, six years back that I gave them the book. He texted me a couple months ago and he said, Hey, I finally, I finally read the book and, um, oh my goodness. I'm, I'm so sorry that I didn't read it sooner because yeah. it had so much good nuggets of truth for, uh, communications directors and for mm-hmm. churches. And I mean, it, it, it talks about all kinds of stuff, but um, I, I would recommend that book, reading it for right. sure. But he, he, <laughs> he was embarrassed that he never read it when I gave it to him six years ago, but yeah. kudos to him. He came back and was like, this is a great book and it's helped me right. a lot, you know? Yeah. And it's a, it's a good way to think about that, um, comparisons that slash, you know, copying yeah. versus, um, Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. stealing like an artist, which isn't in fact stealing, but as much any, any artistic process that people go through, even when you think of musicians, right. Who were, I was emulating this person, you know, and this is how me doing that came out. And then people are like, oh man, that's, you know, that's why we've rock and roll. And then that's why all that stuff I think is, uh, yeah, it's really helpful to think about not only in social media, but just in creativity, um, you know, all of it. hundred percent. Yep. Now, um, you work with a lot of churches, you've seen a lot of things, um, talked with a lot of people who are communications directors, you know, running social media, all that stuff. If you could instantly change one social media behavior that churches commonly do, but is not moving the needle, it's kind of hurting the cause, like, what would that be? Mm. Oh, Scott. Let's see. You have one, so it's a big, it's a big answer. I, I, I can only, I mean, oof. I have so many. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want to share them all. <laughs> um, I think the number one thing is is don't use your social platforms to advertise ministry. Mm. Use your social platforms to do ministry. Yeah, and and I think. Um, there's a lot of great books about that in and of itself, but I think um, when a church is is okay, let's talk to your listeners, just straight up. Go to your church social media feed, whatever platform you want, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter. I don't know if I'll ever call it X without yeah, formerly known Twitter as. Um, but uh, go to your social feeds. Look at it, scroll through it. And if you see, um, if you look at it and four of the last 10 posts are something about you promoting something that's happening at your church, uh, you probably need to pivot. Hmm. And, and the pivot that needs to happen is when we coach churches around uh, trying to do it differently than they've already done then they've done it for years, right? They have, they have put in the work. Uh, a lot of churches don't understand when they, especially when they started social media, they didn't, they mm-hmm. didn't understand how to use it any differently than, than right. what, and they've never changed along the way. But yeah. I think one of the things that a, a, a quick, a quick turnaround, a quick fix of cleaning up your newsfeed is, um, is to create a, especially on Facebook, create a group that is called, I don't know, church announcements, uh, call it, call it church announcements or something. And, and so, uh, give access to all of your staff to that group. They can post everything that's happening that they want to, to their heart's content. But then what you do is you, you, you spotlight that that group like once a week on, on the newsfeed. And you say, Hey, um, 
If you want to know what's happening at this church um, for the next few weeks or a couple of months, make sure that you join uh, the group for church announcements. And it has everything that you need to know. It gives people an option to view it or not, right? Yeah. Because um, if if a church isn't taking advantage of the algorithms, if a church isn't uh, having conversations with people outside the church, then it's really difficult to reach those people by just flooding your newsfeed with um, events, 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 and not ministry, ministry. Here's a story. Um, yeah. Here's inspiration for your day. Here's um, a quote that we really love. But you, you, it's it goes beyond just posting that stuff. It is a culture of engagement, like we've talked about. But um, using using your church social platforms as a billboard or a bulletin board of everything that's happening at your church is, yeah. um, I think, a, a, a misuse of the powerful tool that you have to do real ministry on a digital platform, honestly. Yeah. And I can, good. bro, I've got like five or six more. If you want me to fire them off, like boom, boom, hey, boom, boom. Um, let's, let, let's save that for part two where we talk <laughs> more about Beyonce and then all the, mm. other, all the other things people need to do different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hey, one thing um, we ask everyone on this show, our goal is conversations that empower healthy churches. So we want to always hear the, opinion of our guests in regard to what is one essential component of a healthy church? A uh, healthy church in general or healthy church um, when it comes to reaching the community, which I guess would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Because yeah. if, if a church is really health, healthy, they're reaching their community. Um, I think it starts with a healthy staff, Scott, honestly. Um I, my wife said something to me uh, uh, recently that I thought was just, just so valuable. Mm -hmm. But when, when she, she was talking about, and I'm paraphrasing her, but yeah. she was talking about the valuing and seeing each staff member as a, as a puzzle piece, like mm -hmm. an individual specific puzzle piece instead of an ingredient in a melting pot of yeah. ingredients. And and the reason that she was making that comparison is because when you have a puzzle piece, like my family goes to the library, local library all the time and gets puzzles, especially during like school breaks, summer breaks, holiday breaks. Yeah. Um, and we'll go get a puzzle. And, and uh, the most frustrating thing about checking out puzzles from libraries is oftentimes you will finish a puzzle and there will be one or two pieces that are missing. Brutal. Yeah, it is brutal, especially when you work, you know, three weeks on a beautiful picture, a beautiful puzzle, 2000 piece puzzle. And there's one or two pieces missing. Yeah. And it Oof. drives us crazy. And it, and it draws your eye to the missing piece, right? Yep. It's hard for you in that moment to see the beauty of the entire canvas in front of you of what you've created and even mm. appreciate what you've created because it's, it's not complete. It's not yeah. finished. Right. And I think with the, with the melting pot mindset, um, you, you, every ingredient matters, but once it's in the melting pot, it gets absorbed by everything else. And, yeah. Um, and it's not so much an individual uh, anymore, so m as much as it is like part of the entire uh, package of of whatever is in the pot, whatever you're cooking. Yeah. But I thought that was really, I thought that was really valuable in a sense that um, when she said it, I immediately thought of the last church that I served on, mm. and when I started at that church. Uh, back in 2000, end of 2014, I had never, I had never been on a church staff that was as healthy as that staff. Mm. And, and, and it was so starkly different. Um, not that any of the other churches that I served on were dysfunctional and terrible. That's yeah. not what I'm saying. I'm saying 
there was something different about this staff that made me like made my antenna go up and and I really really wanted to know why is it like this here yeah and so I started noticing some things and and what I noticed was every staff member of that church was for every other staff member of that mm, church it's awesome like we we would do anything and everything as a as a worship pastor um if the kids ministry needed something we stepped up and did it and we yeah. didn't do it begrudgingly which i think yeah. that's a trap man because yeah. there's a lot of church staff members uh, a trend that we're seeing especially uh, and again don't hear what i'm not saying a trend that we're seeing in especially in 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 younger staff members is um if it's not on their job description then sure. they think they think why should i do it yeah and it's not you know having a healthy church starts with having a healthy staff you're yep. not going to have a healthy church without a healthy staff it's just it's impossible because it all trickles down from the top right yeah and That's so good. um i i think if a if a church can really start to value and have conversations with maybe even you have staff members right now that are that are difficult to to work with and having sitting them down and having conversations about what they perceive ministry to be. Yeah. Uh, I learned really late. I, uh, unfortunately, I learned really late in my local church ministry um, that I wasn't called to be a worship pastor. I was just called to be a pastor. Yeah. And worship just kind of was what I did best in that role. Sure in leading people in worship. Right. Yeah. And, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm not called to be a worship pastor and, um, other than a lead senior pastor, I, I think, you know, everybody else is called to the ministry period, whether yeah. you're doing that in kids ministry, student ministry, music ministry, uh, anything. And I think if a staff culture has this sense of, I'm going to help them whenever they help need help. Uh, because, it's that whole, um, uh, gosh, that whole mindset of the rising tide raises all the boats, yep. right? Yep. And so if I help children's ministry, my ministry grows because of it. Yep. Right? Yeah. And, and I think so many staff members are so focused on their silo and yeah. their, their ministry and, and what they're doing. And if someone asks them to do something that's outside of their job description, they immediately go, well, I, I, that's, I'm sure, okay, fine, I'll do it. But they yeah, do it yeah. begrudgingly, or they say no altogether. Right. And having that mindset in a church staff culture is, is toxic. Yeah. It, will, it will be the end of some staff members because of that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and that's what I've learned is, is a, a healthy church is a healthy staff. A healthy staff yeah. is a healthy church that's because awesome. there's, you're so you're so together um yeah. and and in my scenario we valued each individual puzzle piece yeah. right we valued yeah. what they brought to the overall puzzle because yeah. it wasn't complete without them yeah. and if it's not complete without them i'm going to make sure that i do whatever i can to help them get their piece into the puzzle yeah and That's and good. that is i think who I could go on for days on that one, man. But I, yeah. I, I think that's a a good starting point is looking at your staff and maybe even, gosh, maybe even making the hard decision. Sure. Some some people uh, don't need to be on the bus, and yeah. some people need to be in a different seat on the bus. Yep. And that's yeah. just the no, way that it goes. I think that's I think that's good, and I think um, yeah, I think that's really helpful. Uh, we're going to jump into a section we call our final five. Now, these are rapid fire, so these are quick, coming at you. Okay. Um, and, uh, and we'll start with this one, all right? What okay. is one book that you'd recommend to church leaders? Rethink Communication by Phil Battle. Nice. Communication book, if you, want, if you want the nuts and bolts of how to do it well and strategies, that's, that's a great book. Cool. 
we'll link we'll link to that for sure. All right, last thing that you listen to, whether it's Apple Music, Spotify, whatever you stream on. Uh, did you see my post on social media? I don't. I don't. Everybody's posting their Spotify rap. Yeah. And I, I'm like, I'm an Apple Music guy. I, uh, I don't know if that makes me old, um, or lazy uh, because everything <laughs> is connected to Apple Music in my house. All of the, yeah, yeah. all of the Alexas, all of the um, computers and TVs and all of that. So, okay, the last I listened to was, uh, it was, it was a playlist that was playing, and it had the band Lawrence. I don't know if you're familiar with Lawrence. They're incredible. Mm. Nice. The Midnight, um, another band, kind of an 80s vibe uh, band. Love them. Nice. And I, I think the the New Trolls soundtrack. Don't judge me. Don't judge me, no. Scott. I've got, I've got four kids, and yeah. it was all about boy bands, and I was in a boy band. And so... Hey, I, I sp- totally get it. No spoke judgment. Spoke my I language. A huge list of... Uh, Disney movie soundtracks that <laughs> I pretty much have memorized because yep. my kids listen. To Got it. So, I understand that. Yeah. What is uh What is one quote or piece of advice that stuck with you over the years? Um, I think the the biggest thing that I can remember is this quote. Um, most times, let me. Somebody is texting me like crazy, and I'm going to back up. Okay. Do you want to ask that question again? Sure. Okay. So what, uh, what is a quote or piece of advice uh, that stuck with you over the years? Um, I think the best piece of advice, or uh, it's actually both a quote and an advice, but I think it would be uh, most times the right choice and the hard choice are actually the same choice. Mm. That's, yeah, that's good. I've learned that through my life experience. I've learned that especially through parenting. Goodness yeah. gracious through parenting yeah. and, um, and trying to raise little humans to make good decisions, right choices, um, and think about the consequences that each of those have. And I think, I think, uh, I would encourage anybody to, to do the hard things, man. It's, it's, yeah. it's so much worth it on the other side. It may be painful or uncomfortable at first to make that right choice, but making the right choice is the right choice. And, yeah, and that's good. most of the time it's the hardest choice. Yeah. All right. Another one. What is your favorite piece of technology? And you can't see your phone. Sorry. Uh, I, I, if I could throw my phone into the abyss, I would. Um, yeah. Throw uh, it to the ocean and then you're like, I'm never going to go get it. That's so. true. <laughs> yes. Great idea. Okay. So um, I think right now because this would probably change next year but right now it's the doxy go scanner i don't know if you okay. uh i'm a i i run a small business so receipts are constantly coming in right yeah and i actually have it on my desk so doxy scanner super portable scans all your receipts onto cool. this little disc and then you can you never have to keep another receipt it's glorious that's awesome. Um, I think the DG, DG, DJI mic is um, the best piece of microphone technology for uh, short videos, especially web videos and things like that. Yeah. Love it. I'm actually using it today. Yeah. It, it doesn't look like it, but uh, spoiler alert, this is not plugged in. A little behind the scenes. But uh, looky, looky. Yeah, I love hey, it. It's the DJI mic. A little so, behind the scenes uh, mm-hmm. sneak peek for people. You I know, I just like to give the people what they want. Yeah. Well, uh, last one. What is one thing that you'd like to communicate to our audience of church leaders? I would say have a plan and work the plan. Mm, I think a lot, of, a lot of churches, um, A, they, they don't know where to start when they need a plan or yeah. B, they have a plan and it becomes hard, becomes difficult to manage and work that plan. But I would encourage any church to stick, stick with that plan if you have it. Yeah. And if you don't have it, you know, um, well, I can help you with that. But 
but not a sales pitch here. But um, the other thing I would say is take risks, Mm. take, take the risk, try new things, try different approaches. You're not going to change the audience that you have by doing the same things that you're doing over and over. If if you're, if you're stagnant, if you've hit that plateau of attendance, um, try, take a risk, try something completely different than you've ever done because you're not going to get anywhere off of that plateau doing the same things. So yeah, that's good. Uh, try something different. Yep. I love it. Hey, speaking of, would love for you to just help people learn where they can um, connect with you, learn more about what, you know, design three, seven, three is doing and maybe have a conversation about how y'all can yeah. help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can find us online, d373.com. Um, you can um, schedule a call on that website. You can go to our social media play, uh, pages, uh, Instagram and Facebook. You can find us on those, and I'll let you do the honors of posting all of those links. But yep. um, you can schedule a call with me, and cool. I can sit with you, and let's talk about what you're doing. Um. And if there is a way that we can help you, I certainly would love to help you. And, yeah. um, but if nothing else, it becomes a coaching call. I'm, I'm down with that. So let's That's go. Awesome. I love that. I love your heart to, um, yeah, ultimately just to serve the church. And so we'll so, certainly link to all of that. So it's easy for people to connect with you. Yeah. Really appreciate your time today, sharing your wisdom experience. Um, I think it's been, been really helpful for people. And so thank you. Yeah. Uh, and we want to thank you, those watching, listening, uh, for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Hey, if this conversation has been helpful, we'd love for you to share it, uh, leave a review, uh, subscribe, do all of those things. It really helps us out. And so we'd appreciate that. As always, we are really excited to have more conversations that help empower healthy churches. So to that end, uh, we'll see you next time. This episode of the Church Leadership Lab podcast is brought to you by Ministry Brands, the largest provider of church technology software. Over 90,000 churches rely on Ministry Brands for their single platform solution that brings together all the digital tools a church needs. From online giving to websites to church management software and more, Ministry Brands is leading the way in simple to use, innovative solutions all with the goal of empowering healthy churches. To learn more, visit ministrybrands.com.